Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part five of the illustrated mum by Jacqueline Wilson continuing from Serpent. I found my silk scarf and got into bed with Marigold. We didn't bother to get up in the morning. I fixed her some cornflakes and toast about midday and then she huddled back down again while I drifted around the flat. I drew for a bit. I tried to do a picture of Natasha on the back of the empty cornflake packet. I coloured her and cut her out so that I could hold her in my hand. Then I stole a sheet of paper out of Star's school book and invented all these new outfits for Natasha. I drew big tags on the shoulders and cut them all out slowly, careful not to snip off a single tag. But the dresses and the coat and the frilly nighty didn't fit. The arms were in the wrong place so that Natasha's own pink cardboard arms waved about behind the empty sleeves and even the necks weren't right, so the clothes hung stiffly at odd angles. I realised I should have lain the cardboard Natasha down on paper and drawn around her to get an exact fit for the clothes but I was too disheartened to give it another go. I tried to pretend Natasha instead, inventing all sorts of games for us. Marigold must have heard me muttering because she came into the room rubbing her eyes. Is Star back? No. She didn't say when she was coming? No. It could be any time, I suppose, said Marigold. Mickey might drive her back and come up. Hey, we'd better get the place tidied up a bit, doll. Oh God, I look such a sight. Bath time. You come too. You look a bit grubby around the edges. I loved sharing a bath with Marigold because her body looked so bright in the water, a living picture book to gaze at. I liked seeing all the tattoos that usually got covered up. There was a green and blue serpent that wiggled all the way down her spine, twisting first this way and then that, its long forked tongue flickering between her shoulder blades, the tip of its tail way down at the crease where her bottom began. I traced the first few coils and Marigold wriggled her shoulders so that the serpent writhed convincingly. I'd never been all that sure about the serpent. It had tiny hooded eyes that looked sly and scary. Suddenly the serpent seemed too real, as if it was about to wriggle right off Marigold's back and slide up my own skin. I got out, got out of the bath quick. Marigold took ages. She was even longer getting dressed, trying on and discarding practically all her clothes. She ended up choosing an oldish pair of jeans and a pale pink t-shirt that belonged to Star. She wore a pale pink lipstick too and brushed her hair back behind her ears, which didn't suit her. If she hadn't had her vivid tattoos, she'd have looked almost ordinary. I got it. She was trying to show Mickey she wasn't crazy. I didn't dare point out that Star had her train ticket back so Mickey wouldn't be coming anywhere near our house. I didn't want Marigold to get mad at me again for being negative. And I was wrong. When Star came back at long last, not till the evening, she went straight to the window and waved. We heard the car start up and drive away. Marigold dashed to the window too, but Mickey had gone. He drove you all the way from Brighton, I mouthed. He wanted to make sure I was okay, said Star, showing off and that you were too. Of course we're okay, I said crossly. Marigold was still pressed flat against the window. We both watched her anxiously. She looked like she was going to step straight through it. Marigold, said Star. Her shoulders straightened. She turned, blinking hard, her eyes brimming. I could see the pulse flickering at her temple. She took a deep, deep breath, and then she forced her pale pink lips into a silly smile. Did you have a good time, darling? She asked. Yes, I did, said Star defiantly. Good, I'm so glad, said Marigold. I think it's quite wonderful that you have this chance to know your father. Mickey drove you all the way back. Why didn't you ask him up for a drink, sweetie? He had to get back. Right, said Marigold. Well, did he say anything about seeing you again? Next weekend, said Star. That's lovely, said Marigold, and she went to put her arms around Star. Star stiffened at first, but then she suddenly put her arms around Mar Marigold's neck and hugged her hard. I did ask him to come in, and I told him how much you care about him. Oh, Marigold, I wish it would work out the way you want. You and him and Doll and me. I'm sorry. I felt so bad going, but I had to see him. Of course, said Marigold, cuddling her close. He's your father, and he's wonderful, like I've always told you. You mustn't feel bad, my starry girl. You must feel good. I, accept Mickey, I expect Nick, Mickey simply needed to have you all to himself this weekend. He needs this shan to act like a chaperone, right? I understand. Don't worry so. Doll and I had a lovely time together, didn't we, darling? Yes. Yes, we did. A, a lovely time, I repeated. Star interrogated me privately when we went to bed. Shut up about it. A lot you care. If I told you on the phone she was chopping me up with a meat cleaver, you still wouldn't have come back, I whispered bitterly. That's such a stupid thing to say. I was so worried. It kind of spoilt the whole weekend, if you must know. I just kept phoning and phoning and wondering if you were all right. But you didn't come back early to see, did you? Look, it's not like I'm your mother. It's not fair. Why should I always have to look after you? Well, you don't. I can look after myself. I looked after Marigold, too. She got all stroppy and weird, but I handled it. I knew just what to do to get her sorted out. What do you mean, stroppy? What did she do? Nothing, because I stopped her. 
You're coming with me next Saturday. No, I'm not. You are. You have to. You've got to get to know Mickey. Why? He's not my father. I know he's not, but he's still going to look after you. What do you mean? Doll, you have to keep this deadly secret. Do you swear? Yes. Okay. What is all this then? Star got, uh, got out of her own bed and crept across to mine. She leant forward so that her breath tickled my face. I may be going to live with Mickey, she whispered right in my ear. Live with him? Shh, yes. And he says you can come too. We've discussed it all, him and me, and Sean too. They don't always live together. She's got her own flat, but Mickey's thinking of getting a bigger place for the four of us. And Marigold? Don't be silly. I thought about it, my head spinning. It was like one of the fairy tales. No, you don't have to stay locked up with a wicked witch. This handsome prince has come along and he's turned the two little beggar girls into princesses, even the scraggy ugly one, and they can all live in a new fairy castle together. Only Marigold wasn't a wicked witch. She was our mum. We can't leave her. We can still see her whenever we want. But Mickey says she should go into hospital for a bit. He says he knows this great place where they do all this therapy. She'd never go. If she'd just take this medicine, but she wouldn't, then that's not our fault. She's supposed to look after us. We're children. We're not supposed to look after her. The way I've always done. Well, I'm not doing it anymore. I've got two parents now. I want to be with my dad. I think you're horribly mean and selfish. What? Star took hold of my shoulders and shook me hard. How dare you? Look, I could have stayed with Mickey today. That's what he wanted. It's what I wanted too. But I had to come back to get you all sorted out. I needn't have given you another thought, doll. I could have just stayed with my dad. Simple. Perfect. But... We kept thinking about you and how you maybe couldn't manage the way I have. I can manage. And he's perfectly willing for you to come and live with us too. Don't you realise what a big thing that is? I mean, you're not his daughter, and yet he's prepared to look after you, bring you up like he was your dad. I don't want him to be my dad. He doesn't care about me. He only cares about you. I'm his daughter. So you keep saying over and over until I'm sick of it. I'm sick of you, doll. I thought you'd be thrilled. Well, I'm not. I don't want to live with him. I want to live with Marigold. Okay, then. If that's what you want, said Star. She got off my bed and climbed into her own. We both lay still in the dark. I rubbed my scarf against my nose. I kept sniffing and swallowing. I hoped Star might think I was crying. I wanted her to feel mean. I wanted her to tell me she wouldn't go off to live with Mickey without me. I wanted her to stay. I wanted to be the three of us. Marigold, Star and me, the way we'd always been. Marigold was on her very best behaviour all week. She didn't drink at all. She didn't shout or swear at anyone. She didn't go on a wild spending spree. She didn't stay in bed till lunchtime and stay up all night. She wore her mumsy jeans and t-shirt outfit and she made sure we had a proper tea every afternoon. Baked beans on toast, sausage and chips, fish fingers, macaroni cheese. I think she heard you, I said to Star. She's trying to make you want to stay. No, she's being all nicey-nicey because she wants to get around me. She wants me to tell her where Mickey lives. Well, why can't she know? He doesn't want to see her. He's got Sean. I keep saying, he only stayed the other night because of me, said Star, tossing her head so that her hair fanned out. I wanted to grab two silky strands and tug hard. You think you're so special, I said bitterly. Mickey thinks I'm special, said Star. My dad. It's just magic between us. Yuck. You're not jealous. No, I'm not, I said, though I was so jealous I could hardly stand to speak to her. And Marigold is too. She keeps staring at me in this funny way. Have you noticed, said Star. You know what makes me really mad? You can stop her, she can stop herself going crazy. She's been as sweet as sugar all week. She could control herself all the time if she really wanted and act like a normal mum. You always said she couldn't help it when she were funny. I know, I've always made excuses for her. I've done everything. When you were little and she went weird or got drunk, I did everything for you. There's stuff she did that even you don't know about, doll. I tried to look after you properly. I tried to look after her. And yet, do you know something? I've never... Well, it's never quite worked. It's never been enough. It's like she's this little girl at a party and you keep giving her presents, but it's always the wrong ones. She liked her green clasp. She keeps wearing it. I don't mean literally. Oh, you're too young to understand. I felt too young to understand. I wasn't sure if Star really meant all she was saying. She couldn't really seriously intend to leave for ever next weekend. About What about her precious school? I can go to any school in Brighton, she said airily. In fact, Mickey might even send me to a private school. He says I'd probably do even better then. What about all your friends? I can make more friends. What about Mark? Him, said Star scornfully. She meant it too. Mickey must have given her lots of money because she took me to McDonald's one evening and bought me a cheeseburger and French fries, a strawberry milkshake and two ice cream sundaes with butterscotch sauce. 
Some of the boys hung around our table trying to talk to Star, but she showed no interest in them whatsoever. I thought she was simply saving herself for Mark. He was larking about outside with his mates. Janice Taylor was there too. She's welcome to him, Star said to me. When we went outside, Mark called to her. Hey, Twinkle! She didn't even turn around. Twinkle, little Star, hey! He bounded in front of her. Where are you off to then? Home, said Star, pulling me along too. Come for a little walk first, eh? No. Mark stopped, obviously wrong-footed. What? Leave your little sister, come on. No, I said. Are you deaf? Said Star. What's up with you? I've just realised I don't have to hang around with guys like you, said Star. She marched off so briskly I had to run to keep up. Mark missed a beat and then started yelling stuff after her. His mates joined in. They called Star awful names. I felt myself going red all over, but Star stayed cool. You watch it, you pathetic creep. If my dad, dad hears you calling me stuff like that, he'll knock your yellow teeth right down your throat, she said. You're not going to be able to go back to McDonald's now, I said. I don't want to. Not with that crowd. I thought Mark was your boyfriend. No. Anyway, Mickey doesn't think I'm anywhere near old enough for boyfriends, said Star, as if that settled it. She didn't seem to care that I wouldn't be able to go back to McDonald's either. Don't you want a boyfriend now? I asked. Not him. Hey, what about your boyfriend? Who? The owly one. Oliver? Ooh, Oliver, eh? Tell me all about him then. He's okay, I said, shrugging. Oliver was more than okay. He'd had an unsettling weekend too. He was supposed to be going to Legoland with his dad and his lady friend, but his mum had had a migraine, so he didn't go. I really badly wanted to go too, because it's meant to be pretty fantastic, and I've always been nuts on Lego since I was a little kid. I designed my own Lego robots once, and they had a war using those Lego laser guns, and they kept zapping each other and collapsing, and I'd be the robot repairman, doing all the dramatic double-quick surgery to get them fit for battle again. Some kid at the other end of the library sniggered. Oliver blinked behind his glasses. Of course, that was when I was a very little kid, he said quickly. I play games like that sometimes. Pretendy ones, I said. So, will you get to go to Legoland next week? I don't know. My dad was pretty narked with me. He said my mum was just putting it on and I should take no notice. Was she putting it on? Oliver fidgeted, twitching his nose so his glasses shot up and down. She does get lots of these migraines. She had to have a lie down on the settee. I have to keep the television turned right down so as not to disturb her. Well, at least you've got a television. Ours got taken away. She went to sleep. I could easily have gone to Legoland. Dolphin, does your mum get those migraines? Not really. Well, she has a splitting headache if she's drunk too much the night before. Does your mum drink? said Owley, his glasses going up and down like crazy. What, lager and beer and stuff? It's mostly vodka. It's only when she's... Well, she's got these weird spells, see? I felt bad as soon as I'd said it. I put my hand to my mouth, mouth as if the words were blistering my lips. Don't tell, Owley, will you? Oliver. No, of course I won't, Oliver sighed. Your mum sounds ever so exciting. Can I come to tea soon? Well, I thought about it. Marigold was, be Marigold was being so careful. But next week, if Star really went, I shook my head, trying to stop myself thinking about next week. It was far too scary. Oliver mistook my head shaking. Sorry, it's rude to keep on asking you. No, OK, come tomorrow if you like, after school. Oh, wow, great, and I'll be able to see all her tattoos. Not all of them, unless you creep up on her in her bath. Don't be silly, Oliver giggled, going pink. And will she be drunk and fall over? No, and she doesn't fall over anyway, not even in her high heels. She wears wonderful clothes, your mum. It's like she's a rock star. You should see Star's dad, then. He really looks like a rock star. I thought you didn't have a dad. He's not mine. He's Star's. He and Marigold bumped into each other at an Emerald City concert. Go on. Owley listened with his mouth open, as if I was telling him the latest plot in his favourite soap. Star thinks he's wonderful. She goes on and on about him. But I don't like him much. She keeps saying I'm jealous, but I'm not. I don't want a dad. I don't want a dad either, but when he gets all huffy and cross, said Oliver. But I did want to go to Legoland. It was my all-time second favourite destination. So, OK, what's your first favourite? Tea at your house, of course. I nudged him, making sure not to dig him too hard with my pointy elbow. He nudged me back, and then he got out his pencil case and unzipped his secret supply of mini milky bars. One for me and one for you, he said. We slurped chocolate companionably. Hey, 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 this is a library, not a canteen, said Mr. Harrison, bustling past. At least have the decency to offer me a chunk. Arion and Dolphin, I have a secret passion for white chocolate. My name's Oliver, not Arion, said Oliver, giving Mr. Harrison his own bar. Golly gosh, a whole bar for me, you generous lad. 
I know perfectly well you're called Oliver. I was just making a posh literary allusion to amuse myself. There's this old legend where a guy called Arian plays sweet music on his harp and attracts this dolphin. Are you musical, Oliver? I can nearly play Glad That I Live I Am, am I on the uh, recorder. Hmm, well, that's a start, said Mr. Harrison. He licked his lips. Oh, yummy, yummy. Please keep coming to my library, you two. We didn't need any further encouragement. I was starting to look forward to my library lunch times with Oliver. The rest of the time at school still sucked, of course. I did try to swap seats in class so I could be next to Oliver. I talked this boy, Brian, into taking my place. Well, had to bribe him a little, inking a death by Harley Skull and bike tattoo on his arm. It's the tiredest tattoo in the book. Millions of guys all over the world flash identical biceps, but Brian thought it dead original and seriously cool. Some of the other kids started clamouring for me to tattoo them too. Had quite a cluster around me when Miss Hill came into the classroom. I sat in Brian's seat and he ambled over to my old place, next to Ronnie Churley. Everything seemed sorted. Ha! Miss Hill wasn't having it. She took the register and then gave a double take. Go back to your original places at once, Brian and Dolphin. Oh, but Miss, I am Miss Hill, Dolphin, she said, breathing out as she said it, said it, like she was blowing out birthday candles. Now, I'm not having you playing musical chairs in my classroom whenever you feel like it. Sit back in your proper place, if you please. But... Be quiet, Miss Hill yelled. Whenever she wanted silence, she screamed. And when it was silent, she was the one who made the noise. Brian Barley, what is that black all over your arm? She didn't appreciate Brian's skin art. She sent him off to the cloakrooms to have a good scrub with soap. And I'm warning anyone else stupid enough to ink silly pictures all over themselves. I'm quite prepared to bring a bar of carbolic soap and a scrubbing brush to school and I'll scrub it off myself. Miss Hill would have a hard time scrubbing down old bottle nose. Look at her neck. It's almost as black as that stupid raggedy old dress she wears. I felt my neck burning. I didn't know if they were just winding me up or if my neck really was black. It wasn't a place I ever saw. I tried to remember when I'd last washed it. And my dress wasn't raggedy. But now I'd pinned the hem. It wasn't stupid. It was powerful. It was my witch dress. I summoned up all my occult powers. I turned my head ever so casually. And with just one wink of my witch's eyes, I whisked Kaylee and Yvonne right along the corridor and into the girls' toilets where I stuck them down a loo each, head first, telling them to wash their own dirty necks. Then I gazed at Miss Hill. I inked her all over, a full tattoo job, body, sleeve, every single wobbly little bit of her. I threw in a few piercings for good measure, studs along those arched eyebrows, and a ring right through her snooty nose. Why are you staring at me, Dolphin? She said, highly irritated. Get on with your work at once. You of all people need to practice your writing skills. I tried to write. I could make up all sorts of stories, but the torrent of words in my head wouldn't slow down, so I could copy them out on the page. The few that ended up on paper wriggled their letters around so that half of them were back to front. Miss Hill ended up putting a big red line right across my page and told me to do it all over again. Oliver offered to help me at lunchtime in the library. You could tell me what you want to say, and then I could write it out for you, and you could copy it, he suggested. So we did that for a bit, but it got boring and I sometimes mucked it up and copied the words all wrong. I'm not stupid, you know, I said fiercely, pushing the workbook away. I know, said Oliver. You're dyslexic. Does that mean I just can't write properly? That's it. You should have special help. I don't want to be special needs. Yeah, dyslexic. That's what they called me at my last school, but my last school but one. How do you spell it again? Don't ask me. It's a daft word for people who can't write, pop write properly. I'm top in spelling and yet I haven't got a clue. You're top in everything, Mr. Smarty Pants. You should, be in top, you should be top in drawing. That was a great tattoo you did for Brian. You don't do your mums, do you? No, of course not. You have to do like an apprenticeship and there's heaps of stuff to learn. And you have to be seriously scrupulous about sterilising. But I can draw on skin, okay? I'll do you if you like. After school, eh? When I'm at your place. You're scared Miss Hill will get you into trouble, right? Well, under that boring old beige blouse and navy skirt, she's a technicolour dream. I kid you not. I turned over my page and started drawing a naked, tattooed Miss Hill. Oh, Dolphin, your, your story's on the other side. You won't be able to hand it in now, Oliver said, sighing. But he spluttered when he saw what I was drawing. Wow, it really looks like her. Oh, look what you're doing on her chest. Little faces and their mouths are... Oh, Oliver's glasses started to steam up in his excitement. I was getting inspired. I drew the wildest and lewdest and most imaginative tattoos ever, making full use of all her body parts. You are dreadful, said Oliver. I'll never be able to look at Miss Hill again. At that exact moment, Miss Hill walked into the library. Oliver gasped. I whizzed my drawing off the table and into my lap in double-quick time. 
Hello, Mr. Harrison. I've come to collect those books for the Victorian project, said Miss Hill. She looked over at us. Whatever is the matter, Oliver? Oliver's mouth stayed helplessly open. I could see his eyes revolving behind his glasses. Oliver's worried because he was helping me with my story, Miss, Miss, Miss Hill, and he was worried it would get him into trouble. And I said you'd be pleased that he was helping me. It's very kind of him, isn't it, Miss Hill? Well, yes, although really you should be doing the work yourself, Dolphin. Is that your story you're clutching in your lap? Let me see how far you've got. Oliver gave an agonised gasp. No, this is just a first attempt and I mucked it up, I said, crumpling it quickly into my palm. But I'm about to try again, aren't I, Oliver? Oliver nodded, incapable of speech. Very well, I shall await this story with bated breath, said Miss Hill, bustling over to the Victorian section. Mr Harrison went with her. When she'd squeaked off across the polished floor right out the door, he turned and winked at us. I don't know what is actually on that scrap of paper in your hand, Dolphin, but I should hide it right away. Very good advice, Mr Harrison, I said, sticking it in my pocket. Phew, said Oliver, wiping his brow under his long floppy fringe. Pull yourself together now, Oliver. Old Tattoo Tittles is going to make a real point of asking for my story now, I said. Oliver collapsed into helpless giggles. Shh, now, said Mr Harrison. Settle down. Stop being wicked, Dolphin. I shushed. I settled. I stopped. I liked Mr Harrison so much I'd have done anything for him. I wished like anything he could be my teacher, but he had the year threes and I'd missed being one of them. They all loved him. Whenever he was on playground duty, they clustered around him and hung on his hand like he was their dad. I wished he was my dad. I wrote a story called My Dad. Well, I told Oliver and he wrote it and I copied it. My hand was aching by the time I got to the end of it. My Dad. I have this really super dad who can only come and see me once or twice a year because he is always making trips across all the seas in the world observing dolphins. That is why I am called Dolphin. My dad can understand dolphin squeaks and he can swim amongst all the dolphins. And next time he comes to get me, he's going to let me go off with him and I will get to ride on a dolphin's back. And I bet everyone will envy me and my best friend Oliver might get to have a ride on a dolphin too. Really, said Oliver. Really ride on a dolphin, I said. Well, not really, really. No, really. Am I your best friend? Yes. You're coming to tea, aren't you? I said. I was starting to get worried about it. We met up with Star after school and she was unusually sweet, chatting away to Oliver like he was her special little brother, telling him this long funny story about some silly mishap with her hockey stick. Oliver kept giggling. I hung back a step, starting to feel left out, but he lagged a little too, keeping time with me. Star nipped inside the newsagents for a moment and he said shyly, I like your sister. Yes, everyone does. She's ever so pretty, isn't she? Her hair. It's lovely, Oliver paused, but not as nice as yours. This was such a sweet but stupid comment that I went bright red. What's up with you, doll? said Star, coming out of the shop with a big paper bag. Nothing. What have you been saying to make her blush, Oliver? Nothing. You're like a pair of little parrots. Nothing, 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 said Star. Here, help yourselves. She offered us the paper bag. She'd bought sherbet saucers, banana toffee chews, fizzy cola bottles, licorice wheels and long red jelly snakes. Yummy, yummy, said Oliver. We sucked and licked happily all the way home. I felt a bit sick as we went through the broken garden gate and up the path to the front door. The sweet stickiness in my mouth went all metallic. You live in a in quite a big house, said Oliver politely. Ours is just a semi and we might have to move into a flat soon. Ours is a flat. There's an old boot who lives downstairs. We live on the middle floor and there's a ghost upstairs. A ghost, said Oliver, giggling expectantly. Not a silly spook in a white nighty, a real awful mouldering maggoty ghost with bits falling off him at every step. Oliver blinked and stood still. Shut up, said Star, putting her key in the door. Take no notice, Oliver. It's just the man upstairs died and no one's come to clear away his things yet. And once Doll and me thought we could still hear him shambling around upstairs. Really, said Oliver. Not really, really, I said. You can never suss out what's real and what's not, Oliver. I followed Star through the door and pulled Oliver after me. I could smell baking even from downstairs. I exchanged, gl exchanged glances with Star. She looked tense too, wondering if Marigold had baked a hundred and one cakes again. But when we got upstairs, we found it was just one cake, a special ice sponge with a big brown marzipan owl on top. Especially for you, Owly, said Marigold. Oh, Marigold, he's Oliver, not Owly, I said. But Oliver didn't seem to mind. Thank you, he whispered, admiring the cake. He kept darting little glances at Marigold, admiring her too, though I could tell he was disappointed that there wasn't much of her on display. She was wearing jeans and a long sleeve shirt, with the collar turned up so her third eye was hidden. It's not just cake for tea, is it, Marigold? said Star. 
Of course not, sweetie. There's sausage and beans and chips and fruity yogurt and real fruit too, apples and bananas and satsumas. Marigold recited this menu anxiously, waiting for our approval. We ate it all. Oliver got the slice of cake with the owl and then we finished up the rest of Star's sweets. I thought you said you didn't get much to eat at home, Oliver whispered. I've had heaps. He idly sucked at his red jelly snake as he helped clear the table. You don't have to do that, sweetheart, said Marigold, dodging backwards and forwards to the kitchen, still practising being a normal mother. I don't mind a bit. I like to help. Thank you for the lovely tea, said Oliver, a little indistinctly, because he'd wedged his snake between his teeth so he could have both hands free for the dishes. You're a young man after my own heart, said Marigold, rolling up her sleeves to wash the dishes. She saw Oliver staring at her arms and pulled her sleeves down again quickly. Oliver likes your tattoos, I said. Show him my dolphin. Marigold seemed hesitant. She glanced over her shoulder. Star had gone into our bedroom, saying she had to get on with her homework. OK, said Marigold, and let Oliver see the dolphin tattoo. Cool, breathed Oliver, the glistening red tail of his snake hanging out of his mouth. Show him your snake, Marigold, I said. Marigold glanced over her shoulder again, double-checking Star was nowhere around. Then she pulled the tail of her shirt right up around her armpits and showed Oliver the long green coils of her serpent. Ooh, said Oliver. Marigold swelled, je swayed gently to and fro so that the serpent slid sinuously up and down her spine. Ooh, said Oliver, and his mouth opened so wide his own snake dropped out of his mouth, slivered down his t-shirt and ended up stuck on his bare pink leg. My tattoo, said Oliver. Oh, I can't wait till I'm grown up. I want to have tattoos all over. Run and get your felt tips, doll, said Marigold. Right, Oliver, your wish is our command. We sat Oliver on the sofa between us. Marigold drew serpents and dragons and dinosaurs up and down his left arm, while I drew unicorns and mermaids and stars all over his right. Oliver looked left and right, right and left, as if he was watching tennis. His smile stretched from ear to ear. Star came out of the bedroom once to go to the bathroom. Marigold started nervously. Star just shook her head and said, Gross. Do I look gross? Oliver asked, sounding enormously pleased. He nearly cried when it was time for him to go home, and we had to scrub his tattoos away. No, please, I want to keep them, he begged, though he admitted his mum would be shocked. Then she might not let you come around to my place again, Oliver, I said. OK, then, because I so want to come again. This has been my best day ever. Star and I walked him home. He burbled happily until he got near his house. His mother was watching for him behind the curtains. His house looked alarmingly tidy. Even the flowers in the garden looked like soldiers on parade. It was my turn to go to tea with Oliver now, but I wasn't at all sure it was going to be enjoyable. When Star and I got back home, we caught Marigold having a drink, and she kept going out to the kitchen for another sly swig, though she wasn't fooling anyone. Little Owly really enjoyed himself, she said. Oliver. But yes, he did, I said. Thanks for being so nice to him, Marigold. He thinks you're wonderful. Does he? said a Marigold, looking to see if Star was listening. She stretched out on the sofa, pretending to be relaxed. Saturday tomorrow, she said. She paused. Star didn't react. She was staring into space. What are your plans, Star, sweetheart? Marigold asked. Star smoothed back her hair, licked her lips, pressed her knees together. I'm going to Brighton. I thought so, said Marigold. You've been in touch with Mickey then? Yep. Great, said Marigold. That's just great. She heaved herself off the sofa and went to the kitchen. We heard the clank of the bottle on the rim of her glass, and then she came back, the glass brimming. Marigold, don't, I said huskily. What? It's water, darling, said Marigold, taking several gulps. So, Star, it looks as if it's going to be a lovely sunny day. Dolly and I might very well come too, to Brighton. She drank again. Don't, Star said, gently. We'll go with you, darling, the three of us, and we'll meet up with Mickey. No, said Star. Yes, said Marigold, we're coming too, and you can't stop us. Star didn't even bother to reply. She just looked at Marigold in a pitying way. Don't look at me like that, said Marigold. I don't know why you're always looking down on me. I've tried so hard. I've done my best. I want to be a good mother. You are a good mother. You're the best in the world, I said, going to her and taking her glass away so that I could give her a hug. S Star, said Marigold, her voice slurring. Star came slowly over to the sofa. She sat down beside Marigold, put her arm around her, she cuddled her and I cuddled in too, and we stayed like that for a long time. But we were all so tense, it didn't feel like a proper cuddle at all. It felt stiff instead of soft, as if we were stone statues. And then Marigold leant more heavily and started breathing deeply. She'd gone to sleep. Star slid away from her and went into the bedroom. I eased a pillow under Marigold's head, covered her up with a rug and followed Star. 
She had her school bag and two carrier bags packed up ready. You're really not coming back, I said, and I burst into tears. Don't, doll. Please, I can't bear it, said Star, crying too. Don't go. I have to. You can still come with me. No, I can't. Well, see what happens. I'll leave the mobile here and phone you every day to make sure you're all right. Any time you want to come, just say. Let me have Mickey's number. I can't. I won't tell Marigold. You might not mean to, but she'd get it out of you. How are you going to stop her tagging along tomorrow? That's easy enough, said Star. And it was. Star got into my bed and held me close until I eventually went to sleep. I woke up around six, but Star was already gone. I waited for Marigold to wake up. I hoped she'd sleep half the morning, but she woke early too, in spite of her hangover. It's a lovely sunny morning, my girl, she said, coming into our room. She was knuckling her forehead, trying to ease her headache. Then she saw Star's empty bed and stopped dead, her arms still raised. She didn't say anything. She just lay down on Star's bed and started crying. These were new, horrible, heartbroken tears, as if she was choking. It sounded as if her serpent had coiled itself right around her neck. Bats. I thought Marigold might rush us down to Brighton again, but she seemed to have given up on that idea. Her headache was bad and the crying made it worse, so she went back to her own bed. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to play in my own bedroom because it seemed so empty without Star. I felt empty, totally hollow, as if all my insides had been sucked out of me. I wandered around and round the living room, feeling so eerily light that I felt I'd be bobbing up to the ceiling any minute. And then I thought of Mr. Rowling stumbling about on his mouldering feet directly above my head. I looked up at the grimy ceiling. It was easy to imagine the stains of grisly footprints. It got so I couldn't stand it, so I woke Marigold, even though I knew she'd probably be bad-tempered. She was mean at first. She'd got it into her head that I'd ganged up with Star and knew all about her slipping off early. This was so unfair that I started crying. Then she cried too, and we had a cuddle. She smelt bad from the drink, but I didn't mind too much. My doll, she said, all safe and sweet again. Sorry I was so horrid to you, darling. I'll make it up to you, I promise. We'll have a lovely weekend, just you and me, and then Star will come home and we'll be us three girls again. That's what the matter that's what's the matter, isn't it? We're just missing her. I cried harder. I didn't know what Marigold would do when she found out Star was gone for good. I didn't know how I was going to cope. I felt emptier than ever, a balloon girl with a trailing string lost in the emptiness of the sky. I clung to Marigold and she rocked me. I mumbled something about feeling empty. Marigold thought I meant I was hungry. I'm hungry too. Starving. We'll go out for lunch. Right. Uh, and then we'll do a big shop. Yes, we'll buy lots of goodies. We'll make sure there's a special tea for Star when she comes back. And just in case Mickey comes in with her, we'll get some beer in for him. He could make it a little party. Well, we could. She was off again. There was no way I could stop her. She wanted to take me to McDonald's and I couldn't stop that either. Don't be so silly, Dolly. You love McDonald's. But to my great relief, there was no sign of Mark and his mates. It was just crowded out with mums and kids. Marigold hardly ate anything herself, even though she said she was starving. She bought lots for me, even selecting two butterscotch sundaes, just the way Star had done. It made me miss Star terribly. Did she really mean it? Wasn't she ever going to come back? How could she leave Marigold? How could she leave me? My tummy went tight. Sour ice cream suddenly hurtled backwards from my stomach, and I had to dash to the toilets. I felt emptier than ever afterwards. Marigold took me on the promised shopping spree, using the credit card I was so worried about. We bought food, we bought drink, too much drink, and we bought clothes, new black jeans and a long sleeve black satin shirt for Marigold, new blue jeans and blue shirts for Star and me, new 90s too, black lace for Marigold, blue and white gingham check with white lace trim for Star and me. Marigold even bought blue and white paint to brighten up our bedroom, though I tried to stop her. She was tired when we got home, and she had a drink or two, and then the phone rang. I only got to talk to Star for two seconds because Marigold grabbed the phone from me. She tried so hard to sound sweet and mumsy and normal that the veins stood out on her white forehead. You're having a lovely time, darling. Good. Hey, bad girl, you shouldn't have left early like that, slipping off to the station yourself. I don't know, but Mickey got you. Uh, he met you okay. Can I have a little word with him, sugar bunch? I just want to check how things are, see what time you're both coming back. Hey, we're going to have a little party for you. You'll make sure Mickey comes, right? Star? Star? She drank quite a lot after Star, Star rang off. I didn't mind quite so much because she'd bought me one more present, new felt tips and a big drawing book. I drew me in my witch's black help velvet with a special silver glittery outline all around me to make me extra powerful and totally protected. Then I drew me walking along and exercising my witchly powers on anyone who got on my nerves. I redrew Miss Hill, tattooing her even more inventively. It started to look a little bit like a comic strip. 
I decided to show it to Oliver in the library on Monday. I could maybe draw speech bubbles and, and tell him what to put, and then he could write the words in for me. I drew Oliver, but this time my witchly powers waxed white instead of black, and he grew taller and tougher and his eyes became laser powerful, so they could sizzle straight through his specs, searing everyone in sight. I gave him a haircut too, snipping off his long lank fringe and wispy strands until he just had a butch bristle left, transforming his face. I drew Star and I gave her a haircut too. I gave her a terrible unflattering bob that left her neck long and awkward and her face too exposed. I dotted spots all over her skin and bloated her body so that she was so fat she bulged right out of her clothes. She waddled desperately after a stick man Mickey. He was running hard from this horror of a daughter. I drew tears and snot dribbling down Star's face but her expression looked too real. I suddenly felt frightened. I tore the page out and shredded it into little pieces. I started to draw Star again, but I didn't trust my pen. I tried Marigold instead, but I was too tired and I couldn't be bothered to ink in all her tattoos. She looked really odd without them, the way most people look in their underwear. Look, Marigold, I said. She was asleep, her head on the table. That's beautiful, doll, darling, she whispered, and then I went to bed. Marigold was up before the next morning. She woke me with a breakfast tray, I blinked at it in astonishment. I stared at Marigold. she tied her hair up in an old chiffon scarf and was wearing an old shirt and a pair of knickers. Come on, sleepyhead. Eat up, said Marigold. You need a big breakfast. We've got work to do. Work? Yes, work, Dolly Daydream. Why do you think we bought the paint yesterday? We're going to transform your bedroom. Star doesn't like all the stars and stuff. She thinks it's childish. She wants a pretty conventional bedroom. I like the stars, I said, fidgeting anxiously. And all the dolphins. My orange juice tipped and spread a gaudy stain across the sheets. Clumsy, said Marigold, but she wasn't cross. Still, it's time they had a good wash. She was already getting to work scrubbing down the walls. Please, Marigold, I want it to stay the way it is. It's my bedroom too. Oh, darling, we're going to make it so much prettier. Star will love it. Blue, such a beautiful blue, with a white gloss surround. It'll be such a surprise for her. If we really get cracking it, it'll all be done when she gets back. What if... I couldn't finish it. I tried to eat my cornflakes, spooning in several mouthfuls. The mush stayed in my mouth. I pushed it in one cheek and then the other. It wouldn't go down. I gave up and spat it back into the bowl when Marigold wasn't watching. I helped her all day long, scrubbing down, covering up all our clutter with old sheets and newspapers, and then painting. I was scared she'd seen some of Star's stuff, was gone, but she didn't notice. Star hadn't taken much, just her favourite jeans, her boots with heels, her trainers, her best skirt, several tops, her jacket, a couple of books, her hairbrush, her nail varnish, and her new teddy bear. Maybe she didn't mean it. She'd come back this evening. But she didn't. Marigold started to get the tea ready as soon as she'd finished painting. She hummed as she arranged little titbits, prettily on plates. She was still in her shirt and knickers, dancing around to Emerald City, playing the fool. She saw me staring at her. What? Okay, okay, I'd better get some proper clothes on before they come. She frowned. Why are you looking at me like that, doll? She peered down at herself. Do I look awful? I don't look all old and scraggy, do I? No, of course not. You look young and pretty. Pretty awful, do you mean? Marigold looked down at herself anxiously. She peered at her long thighs. A flock of bats flew upwards, their wings outstretched, the largest no bigger than my thumbnail, the smallest much more, much, not much more than a black dot. I got such dreadful stretch marks when I was expecting you. I got so sick and fat, yet with Star, I hardly showed right up until the end. Look at these marks. Her long nails scrabbled at them, as if she could scratch them straight off her skin. Maybe if I had a cover-up tattoo over the bats. But it upset Star so. Star, 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 I said. Why do you have to keep going on about her all the time? Oh, doll, don't be so silly, Marigold said, pulling her jeans on and covering up her legs. Does this shirt look okay? There's a little painty spot, but that maybe makes it look homey. You love Star more than you love me, I said. I love you both, said Marigold. She hesitated. But Star is Mickey's child. Yes, and she's with him now, I said. She's gone to him. I've stayed with you. Why can't you love me best? Don't start a stupid scene, doll, Marigold said briskly, stepping into her high strappy sandals. Star and Mickey could come back any minute. Now stop the nonsense and help me get everything ready. I went and sat on my bed in the newly painted bedroom. All the stars were lost under a blur of blue. I cried. Cheer up, silly crybaby, said Marigold. But as the hours went by, Marigold grew shrill. Where are they? What's happened? Oh God, you don't think there's been a crash, do you? The phone suddenly rang, startling her so that her arms flew up in the air. I reached for it, but she was there first. Star, darling. Oh, thank God, you're all right. And Mickey, why are you so late? Where are you? What? What did you say? 
I don't understand. What do you mean, you're still in Brighton? But you're not going to be back till late. What? You're not making sense, sweetie. You're not going to be back. What do you mean? Marigold babbled on and on to the phone, clutching it so tight she embedded it into her head. What do you mean? She repeated again and again. Then her whole stance changed, as if an electric shock had gone through her. Mickey, look, darling, what is Star going on about? Why are you still in Brighton? It's going to take you hours to get here. No, no, look, she's not staying with you, not even overnight. For God's sake, put her in the car and come here. We can talk it over then. She can't stay. She hasn't got any of her things. What? Look, there's school. She can't miss school. Wait till the summer holidays. It's not long now. Then she can stay a few days. That's a lovely idea. But she can't stay now. I won't allow it. I'm her mother. Mickey. Mickey, please. She bent right over, tears spilling down her face. Star, she whispered. Please, Star, come home. Don't do this to me. Look, we've got a surprise for you, doll and me. What? No, Star, I'm talking to you. Oh, please. She shook her head, but then held the phone out to me. Its imprint was marked clearly on her face, a crude new tattoo. I took the phone from her. Star was crying the other end. Dolly, are you all right? Yes. No. Oh, Star, please come home. I can't manage without you. I can't come. Don't make me feel even worse. I'm sorry, doll. I'm so sorry. Look, I'll phone every day. I'll keep in touch. You'll be okay. I had to cope with her right from when I was little. I looked after her and you. You said yourself she's better with you. I think I just made it harder for her because I'm Mickey's. Look, I won't stay away forever. I'll come back soon, I promise. But I just have to stay now. I have to be with him. He's my dad. This is my one chance to be with him. If I come back now, she'll never let me go. You know that. Oh, doll, I feel so bad, but you do understand, don't you? No, I don't, Star. Come back. You can't leave me. I have to, said Star, and the phone went dead. I let it drop out of my sticky hand. No, don't. Give it to me, Marigold cried, on her hands and knees, grabbing for it. She started yelling into it, screaming at Star. She's hung up. She's not there. Stop it. She's left us. She's left us forever. I hate her. I hate her. I hope she never comes back, I shouted. I clawed the phone away from Marigold and bashed it hard against the wall again and again. You'll break it, Marigold screamed. I stopped dead. I shook the phone. I tried to dial a number. It was no use. It was broken. We'll get another, I said quickly. You can get one on that credit card. Marigold shook her head. She can't ring on any other phone. She won't know the number, and we don't know hers. Oh, oh, Marigold. My legs buckled and I slid to the floor. She reached out. I ducked, thinking she was going to hit me, but she just wiped my tears with her fingers. I didn't mean to, I sobbed. I know. It's all right. It's not your fault. Did you know Star was going for good? I'm sorry, I wept. Never mind, said Marigold. Never mind. Never mind. She said it over and over again until the words lost all sense. Then she started drinking. I stayed with her for a while and then sloped off into the bedroom. It still smelt terribly of paint. I couldn't shut the white gloss door because it was still sticky. I got into bed, but I couldn't sleep. I wanted Star so badly, I got into her bed to sniff the faint, talcumy smell of her, still on the pillow. But it made me angry too. I punched the pillow harder and harder, and then I missed and punched the wall instead. It hurt so much that I huddled into a ball, tucking my fist into my armpit. I was acting like the crazy person now, smashing everything. Maybe I was going to go mad like Marigold. We'd both end up in the loony bin. While Star had her shiny new life with her father. I couldn't wake Marigold in the morning. She'd managed to get herself to bed, but the vodka bottle was empty. I stood shivering, staring at her. She was breathing heavily, her eyes open a fraction. I shook her hard. She mumbled a bit, but she didn't make sense. I got myself ready for school, creeping round the flat. I backed away from the broken phone on the floor, as if it could bite me. I grabbed a handful of the stale party snacks, left out all night, and then went out to the door. I tiptoed down the stairs, but Mrs Luft was out like a flash. You! That row last night! Screaming, shouting, bang, bang, banging! I'm going to get you all evicted, you see if I don't! Where's your sister? It's none of your business, I said, and I ran out of the house. It was so odd walking down the road without Star. It felt like a part of me was missing. When I turned the corner, there was Ronnie Churley right in front of me. I stopped dead, but he was with his mum, not his mates. All he could do was stick his tongue out at me when she wasn't watching. He looked a bit embarrassed. Mr Tough Guy discovered trotting along with Mummy. I stuck my tongue out back at him and then skipped past, singing out, Mummy's little diddums. He'd get me for it later, but it was worth it. I was on my own. It was cool to walk alone to school. Ronnie Churley's mum looked horrible too, a frowny lady with those funny trousers with little straps that go under the foot to stop them wrinkling. She needed a strap under her chin and all to tighten, straighten out her face wrinkles. 
I didn't think much of any of their mums, not even Tasha's. Marigold was much younger and much prettier. Oliver thought it was t thought she was too. He was already in the playground, leaning against the railings right at the front. He often hung about there because it was so public it was hard for anyone to pick on him. Hi, Dolphin. He waved at me frantically. He was so short-sighted he always thought no one else could see a foot in front of their face. Hi, I said, climbing up over the railing and swinging down the other side instead of bothering to go all the way around to the front entrance. The hem of my witch skirt caught. I unhooked it, seeing, it, seeing tiny toads and black cats and bats fluttering free. A flock of bats whirled around my head so that I could barely see. Dolphin, what is it? Have you hurt yourself? said Oliver. It's not me. It's my mum, I said, and I started crying. Don't, said Oliver. Oh, Dolphin, don't, please, don't cry. He put his skinny arm awkwardly around my neck. There was a shriek from the other side of the railings. Look at Bottlenose and Owly. They're practically snogging. Yuck. Quick, come round the back of the playground toilet, said Oliver urgently. There was a narrow gap between the girl's building and the boy's. Oliver edged into the middle and pulled me after him. I stood bolt upright beside him, tears still trickling down my face. Haven't you got a paper hanky, said Oliver. No, I haven't, I said, scrubbing at my eyes with the back of my hand. I gave a big sniff. Stop staring at me. It's all right, I cry too. I cried this weekend because my mum cried when Dad brought me back. Well, I haven't got a dad. Star has, and she's gone off with him. And now I've broken the phone and we can't get in touch. And Marigold, she's drinking. She wouldn't even wake up this morning. You don't want, don't know what it can be like. Star always did stuff, cleaned her up and looked after her when she was really bad. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do any, anything without Star. She's not just like my sister. She's like my mum too, and my best friend. And now she's walked out on me and I haven't got anyone. I started sobbing again. You've got me, said Oliver. We could hear the bell ringing in the playground. We'd better go, I said. We can't really hole up here all day long. I mean it, Dolphin. I can be your best friend. I'd like that, said Oliver, and he twisted his head around and kissed my cheek, even though it was all teary and disgusting. Then he edged out quick. It took me several seconds to squeeze out after him, but he was still bright red, with his glasses all steamed up. He looked incredibly silly, but I managed to give him a wobbly smile. Okay, best friend. Lessons, and then let's make up our own comic strip in the library at lunch. Oh, wow, yes, let's. And maybe Star will be back by tonight. Yes, I bet she'll come back right away, said Oliver. I counted in sevens and made endless wishes and bargains and made up witchy spells all day long. As I ran home, I touched each lamppost and whispered Star seven times over for every one so that she would be waiting for me in our new blue and white bedroom. She wasn't waiting. Marigold was lying on her bed, still in a nightdress. She didn't get up all afternoon and evening, apart from stumbling to the toilet like a zombie. Why don't you clean your teeth and have a wash, I suggested. Teeth? Wash? Marigold repeated, as if I was speaking a foreign language. What's the point? Well, it'll make you feel better. She took no notice and got another bottle from the cupboard. Don't drink. Eat, I said, and I made us both some tea. Marigold said she didn't want any. I tried to prop her up against her pillow and help her sip a cup of tea, but half of it dribbled down her chin. Please try, Marigold, I begged. I don't want to try, she said. Just let me be. She slid back down under her duvet. I watched over her for a while. She seemed to be asleep. I wasn't sure if she was drunk or not. I fidgeted around, staring at her closed eyes and tousled hair and technicolour skin. I vaguely heard a faint ringing from downstairs, and then a minute later there was a banging at the door. You in there! Come and answer the door! It was Mrs Luft. I decided to take no notice, but she went on banging. Oh God! My head! Marigold groaned, going further under the duvet. Get rid of the old bag, doll. I don't like her. She's horrid to me. You go, I said. I had as much chance of the duvet rising upwards and slivering to the floor to deal with Mrs. Luft. I had to go by myself. For goodness sake, about time, Mrs. Luft shouted when I opened our door an inch. What's going on in there? Nothing. Nothing, I said. I opened the door properly, stepped outside and pulled it to behind two behind me. I couldn't have her barging in and seeing Marigold in a stupor. This is a one-off. I want to make that crystal clear. It's a total liberty. I've got better things to do than climb up all these stairs. You don't even answer the door straight away like normal folk. Anyway, it's tying up my phone. Someone might be wanting to speak to me. I suddenly understood. My sister. She's phoned you. I started flying down the stairs. Hey, hey, wait for me. Don't you dare go in my flat by yourself, young lady. The cheek of it. I had to hover until she got there, there herself and then trail after her into her darkly polished domain. She made me wipe my feet on her doormat. She probably doused the telephone with disinfectant the minute, minute I'd stopped using it. Star? 
Oh, Dull! Oh, Dull! Oh, Dull! Star was crying. What's happened? What's the matter with the mobile phone? I was so worried when I couldn't get through, and then I suddenly thought of Mrs. Luft. What's Marigold done? Has she smashed the phone? She hasn't done anything to you, has she? I thought quickly, my eyes swivelling around Mrs. Luft's horrible brown living room. She had a mottled browny pink lamp and a matching vase that looked like liver sausage. I put out my hand to touch the vase to see if it felt like liver sausage too. Mrs. Luft flicked my fingers away, outraged. Doll, tell me what's happened. It's been so awful, I said. I turned my back on Mrs. Luft and started whispering. She's been so drunk. Well, she often is, said Star. No, worse. So violent. She broke the phone. She hit me and hit me. I'm bleeding. I think she's broken something. I whispered. And now, now she's drunk an entire bottle or two. And she's in a coma. And she might even be dead. Oh, doll. It's all right. I'll come and... But a whirlwind in a nightdress barged uninvited into Mrs. Luff's flat and snatched the telephone before I could stop her. Star? Oh, Star, sweetie, how brilliant of you to phone Mrs. Luft, said Marigold, without so much of a slur to her voice. It was dreadful cheek, and it's certainly not going to happen ever again, said Mrs. Luft. Now get off that phone. In a minute, Marigold muttered, obviously trying to concentrate on what Star was saying. I did what? Star, sweetie, no, it was Dolly. But it was an accident. We'll get another phone. But why don't you and Mickey stop playing silly games and give me his phone number? No, of course I'm not drunk, darling. Do I sound drunk? What? OK, speak to Doll again, but we've got to talk too. Not on my phone, you don't, said Mrs Luft indignantly. Just say your goodbyes. I can't believe you can be so rude. Marigold pressed the phone into my palm. I didn't hold it too close to my ear. Star's words shot out like bullets. Doll, how could you lie like that? She's not in a coma. She's not even drunk. I was so scared. How could you say it? She did. She did, I mumbled, though Marigold was standing right in front of me, staring into my face. You were just lying to get me to come home. So, it was you who broke the phone? No. Yes. Look, Star, please, please come back now. Why should I? It's not fair. I want to do what I want to do, just this once. Now listen, we'll send you another phone, right? But don't you dare ever tell lies like that again. Star, no, I'm putting the phone down now. Please. I heard a click, and then the purr of the freed line. Let me talk now, said Marigold. No, this has gone too far. Put my phone down at once, said Mrs Luft. Marigold snatched the phone from me and then heard the dialing tone herself. Put it down, Mrs Luft commanded. Marigold did as she was told, her hand trembling so that she could barely slot the receiver back into its socket. Thank you very much, said Mrs Luft sarcastically. Now, if it's not too much trouble, could you both go back upstairs to your own place? And don't you dare use my flat as your personal telephone box. Get your own phone reconnected and stop wasting all your money on your disgusting habits. Look at you, wandering around in your skimpy nighty, showing off all your lurid tattoos. What sort of example are you to your little girls? No wonder one seems to have scarpered. Who would want a mother like you? I expected Marigold to yell a whole load of abuse, but she didn't say a word. Her eyes looked dazed. She turned and picked her way towards the door in her bare feet. Look at those black soles. You'll make marks all over the carpet, said Mrs Luft. Marigold didn't seem to be listening. I want my mum. She's the best mum in the whole world, I said. What rubbish. I heard what you were saying, how she hits you. When the pair of you have been screaming, I've had it in mind to phone the welfare people. You mustn't. Please don't. There's nothing wrong. Marigold's never hit me. Ever, 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 I said. Don't tell anyone, please. Mrs Luft folded her arms triumphantly. We'll have to see, won't we, she said. Look, it's for your own good. Marigold, tell her. Tell her you've never done anything to me. I made up some stuff, but I didn't mean it, Marigold. Marigold was already halfway upstairs, so I ran after her. I pulled at her arm. Marigold, we have to tell her everything's fine. We can't have her phoning any welfare people, can we? Why not? Marigold said, her voice sounding flat and far away. Because they might put me in a home. Maybe you'd be better off, said Marigold. That old bat was right. I'm not a fit mother. Yes, you are, I argued. I tried to cuddle up close to her when we were back in the flat. I held her tight, but I still couldn't get close enough. I pulled her arms around me, but after a few seconds they flopped to her sides. I begged her to talk to me, but the voice she replied in didn't seem to belong to her. Her eyes were dull and dark, barely green. Do you want to go back to bed? I said. You look ever so tired. She went to bed obediently and closed her eyes at once. I leant over her and kissed her on the forehead. I said some stupid stuff about you, but it was just to make Star come back, I whispered. Marigold didn't reply, but a tear trickled beneath one of her eyelids. I think I'll go to bed too, I said. I held it up in my strange lonely room. I played games inside my head, pretending I had discovered a secret time machine. 
If I touched a special stud on my mattress, I hurtled forwards ten years and grew willowy and beautiful with long, thick hair down to my waist. Not fair like star, red like marigold. No, as I got older, my mousy hair would darken and I'd be raven black at twenty with my own green eyes outlined with sooty lashes. I'd have clear white skin with just one exquisite secret tattoo on my shoulder, a little back witch. I'd have a nose stud too, an emerald to match my eyes, but I'd take it out at work and wear sleeves and tie my long hair back into a chic swirl on top. I'd wear black jeans and a black smock and have my own magical hair salon where I'd invent wonderful exotic styles for very special people. I'd adorn hair with flowers and little crystals and beadwork. I'd dye it fantasy shades of purple and turquoise and sky blue. I'd cut and colour and crimp all day while models and rock stars and fashion editors fawned all over me and famous photographers recorded my creations. I'd be taken out by a different dynamic man every single night of the week and I'd allow them to buy me food and flowers and fine wines. But then I'd go home to my beautiful stylish designer flat, silver and black with a mirror ball revolving in each ceiling so that the sparkles of light glimmered in every room. Star and Marigold would be there, desperate to please me. If I wasn't too tired, I'd maybe be persuaded to style their hair or paint a nail polish design on their fingertips. They'd be so grateful to me and they'd beg me to promise to stay with them forever and ever. I fell asleep dreaming this and then kept half walking in the night, not sure whether I was still dreaming or not. I thought I heard Marigold in the kitchen, but when I stumbled in there, there myself to get a glass of water, there was no sign of her. I drank the lot, the glass clinking against my teeth. My tummy rumbled and I remembered I hadn't had any tea. I wondered if I should try to eat something now, but the smell of paint was making me feel sick. It seemed stronger than ever, harsh in my nostrils, making my eyes water. I needed to go to the bathroom, bathroom after gulping down all the water. I opened the door and saw a white ghost in the moonlight. A ghost, really there, glowing, glowing eerily white. I screamed. The ghost gasped too. I knew that sound. I knew that smell. I pulled the light cord and stared at the white figure before me. Marigold. I couldn't believe what I saw. She was white all over, even part of her hair, her neck, her arms, her bare body, her legs. She'd painted herself white with a gloss paint. There were frantic white splotches all over her body, covering each and every tattoo, although the larger, darker ones showed through her new white skin like veins. I put out my hand to touch her, to see if it was real. No, don't. Not dry yet, said Marigold. Not dry. Wet. So I can't sit down. I can't lie down. I can't. But that's okay. I will dry, and so will I. And then I'll be right. I'll be white. I'll be a good mother and a good lover, and Mickey will bring Star back, and we'll be together forever and ever, a family, my family, and it will be all right, it will, it will, it will, I will it, it has to be better, it couldn't be worse, this is a curse, but it will be better, 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 no more tattoos, Star hated them, she hated me, but now they're gone, until the laser, could I use a razor, no, too red, I want white, Pure light. That's right. She went on and on, muttering weird half rhymes to herself. I stood shivering beside her. She had gone really mad now. Crazy. Bonkers. Bats. And that is where we will leave part five of The Illustrated Mum by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye bye.